Welcome everybody. <laughs> Welcome everybody on Zoom to the Planning Advisory Committee for the uh, SCTA. Uh, first item on our agenda this morning is introductions. And I guess we can start north to south as we typically do. Uh, so Kevin, I'll throw it over to you for introductions. Oh, hey, Noah, it's uh, Kevin with the city of Cloverdale. And I'm Noah House, city of Kitati. Uh, Carrie Sponstrom, City of Sebastopol. <laughs> I don't know what's so I know, yeah, sorry. I, I should have said it a lot better. We'll just go left and right. We'll go right to left. Dana Trey, SCTA, RCTA. Uh, Scott O'Rourke, County of Sonoma. Will Lyons, County of Sonoma. Adam Garcia, SCTA, RCTA. Drew Nichols, SCTA, RCTA. Sheila Walski, City of Santa Rosa. Ellen McDowell, City of Healdsburg. Chris Barney, SCTA, RCTA. Tanya Narath, SCTA, RCTA. And then our Zoom attendees. Uh, I'll jump in and start. This is BC Caps with RCPA, SCTA. Hey, this is Emily Betts with SMART. Uh, Ross Pondenen, SCTA, RCPA. Great, thank you, everyone. Uh, so we'll move on to our announcements. Chris, we have any announcements this morning? Uh, nothing that's not already on the agenda. Perfect. Uh, so we have some administrative items. We are going to be moving the uh, minutes from the October 19th meeting to the next agenda. So that is not on uh, our agenda today, but look for that next time. And do we have any changes to this agenda? Great. So we will adopt this agenda, which we don't usually have a vote for, correct? Title. See the form right now. C5. So I think we accept that's pretty presented with no action. Yeah, perfect. Okay, we will accept that. Uh, and then, uh, Chris, do you want to talk about the proposed 2024 meeting schedule? Yeah, so Drew puts this together every year. So just an uh, outlook of preliminary meeting dates for all of our committees, including our SETA RCPA board and past meetings for the rest of the year. So um, just putting this out for your information. And if we need to, uh, along the way, we can move a meeting date if there's a need to do that. So just wanted to make sure that's available and so you know kind of what things are looking like right now. Great. So for participants, if you guys could just take a look at your availability and let Drew know any limitations for your 2024 vacation schedule or uh, planned outages. Uh, and then with that, we'll move on to item four, our CPA uh, countywide equitable building electrification action plan for BC Caps. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to confirm you can hear me all right. Yep. yep. Great. Thanks. Uh, I apologize. I'm not able to be there in person. I was looking for very much looking forward to being there today, but uh, uh, I'm needing to work from home this morning and glad, though, that I can uh, have the ability to present here remotely. So. Uh, I had a short presentation I wanted to walk through uh, quickly, and I wanted to check Drew or Chris. Is it possible to share that from the meeting room? Yeah, you should be able to be seen. Hopefully, you heard a little bit over here. But you I see, that's a like... yes. And I know that it's a fairly full agenda today, so I don't want to take too much time, uh, but I did want to give a brief presentation. Uh, this is kind of a repeat of some information that was presented to our uh, board of directors on Monday, the what was that Monday, the 11th, a uh, week and a half ago or so. Um, so this is information on a project that we are going to be, uh, our CPA staff is going to be um, embarking on. Um, uh, over the course of the next uh, two years uh, on working on a, a countywide equitable building electrification action plan. Uh, the overall attempt is really to pull together all of the um, uh, all of the existing resources and information that's available around building decarbonization and really kind of try to put things in order that uh, really kind of an implementation and action plan. Uh, that can be used both at the county level and by local jurisdictions. Um, and let's see. True, let me know if you've got that or if you need me to pull it up from here. Great. 
Hey, that's looking good. Okay, great. And I think we can go to the next slide then. Very good. So uh, as I was just saying, this is uh, wanted to talk through the purpose of this effort, uh, talk a little bit about alignment that we are seeking with local jurisdictional plans. Um, and then wanted to talk about some key elements of our action plan and um, kind of our next steps. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so the purpose, the overall purpose of this effort to develop this action plan is really going to be to define a roadmap to improve the energy efficiency and electrify residential and commercial buildings throughout Sonoma County. Um, building decarbonization was identified as one of the uh, the number one strategy or the first strategy in our climate mobilization strategy that was adopted by our board uh, in 2021. And so this is kind of following up on that work. Uh, so it's really defining a roadmap to improve the energy efficiency and electrify the buildings. Uh, we also want to, uh, point number two, we wanted to outline potential policy options um, and programs that our board and other jurisdictions could consider for adoption over the next few years. And uh, we were hope we want to engage with the community at a uh, at a larger scale uh, to gather input on the action plan and specifically to really integrate the equity considerations into all aspects of this plan. So with that next slide, please. Um, so as I was mentioning, the climate mobilization strategy was adopted by our board in March 2021. Uh, it has a number of 13 strategies across four major initiative areas, and this is really digging in on the ver on the first uh, number one a decarbonization of building energy. With that next slide. Uh, so looking at what is identified as actions within the climate mobilization strategy, uh, this uh, the kind of this first strategy on our all electrics building campaign um, is really looking at both work on existing buildings to try to determine how to retro develop retrofit requirements to transition all existing residential or all existing buildings to be all electric and or to improve their overall energy efficiency. Um, number two, it's also look, uh, talks about um, looking at developing strategies for new buildings. Uh, a lot of that, the majority of that work is done through uh, reach codes with the building uh, uh, with the building code. And then the third item that was identified in the mobilization strategy was really to focus on uh, to was the integration of social. Uh, racial, social, and environmental equity issues into this work kind of top to bottom. Next slide. Um, so digging in just a little bit on this aspect of kind of the, the social equity aspects, um, this is something that is coming up um, in a number of documents I'm seeing um, um, both in California and across the United States um, as jurisdictions and states move forward on decarbonization efforts and really looking at how the benefits of this work um, can be more equi equitably spread across the entire population and that households, kind of lower income households or those that don't have the means are really not left behind. Um, a couple of the key considerations are the fact that even the upfront costs of some of this upgrade work, um, even if there are incentives and rebates at play, and even if the um, improvements will save money over time, even those upfront, that upfront investment um, is certainly a hurdle for a number of low and middle income households. Um, there's also a lot of issues having to do with renters, um, renters feeling uh, like they don't have control over their space uh, and needing to work with the building owner or their landlords to make improvements. And then unfortunately, the adverse effect that when many of these improvements have been made, the cost of the, the value of the property, the um, attractiveness of the rental property increases, the overall general community um, uh, uh, community may increase with uh, become a more positive, uh, more um, attractive area to live in. And in a case of kind of environmental gentrification, uh, we can actually see rates um, um, uh, uh, rental rates um, uh, go up um, and price people out of the homes that they're actually have been living in. Uh, 
So we're hoping really to kind of uh, develop strategies from top to bottom across kind of to, to think about all of these issues. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> wanted to talk very briefly about some work that I uh, have been doing in conjunction with our uh, newest staff member, Anna Oliva, who joined our team uh, this past year. Uh, she is working through, has been collecting and working through all of the local climate action plans, mobilization strategies, at climate action frameworks. There's a number of different um, uh, titles that are being used, but basically trying to go through, work through these documents. We're compiling them into a comprehensive matrix where we'll be able to do searches across jurisdictions and really can then try to line up for this work. And um, this effort actually applies not just to the building decarbonization work, but I think across a number of our efforts to really look for where is the alignment across jurisdictions, what has been prioritized a kind of at a top bottom up approach within specific jurisdictions and then using that as a guide for how that we should move forward. Um, so we will be presenting more on that whole comprehensive uh, matrix at a later date, but that's something that uh, Anna and I have been working on, uh, and it's been a good resource so far. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just list out a few of those actions that are identified in those existing plans. Uh, kind of no surprise here number of jurisdictions have uh, adopted priorities to work on either all electric reach codes uh, or work on existing buildings uh, to, to convert those, to upgrade the appliances there, and also to work on um, 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 identified the, the need to work with property managers and renters to retrofit multi-housing properties. Um, my mind uh, mindset around a lot of this work over the last few years has really been based in the single family residential uh, mindset. We have a whole neighborhood. We need to go one door at a time. Uh, I'm starting to see more and more and certainly seeing in the literature and a lot of the emphasis or interest from the jurisdictions that with working with multifamily properties that we may be able to work with a uh, one could work with a single building owner and do um, four, eight, 10, 30 units um, kind of make those upgrades all at once. So there's a lot of potential we see there. Next slide, please. Um, Little overview just on our emissions. I don't need to go into this detail into detail too much. Uh, we've been watching our uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the county uh, settle steadily go down over the last thirty years. Uh, that's uh, um, uh, very much to kind of all of our collective credit. In the building energy space, that um, uh, those emissions have dropped nearly fifty percent over the last thirty years, um, and a huge portion of that is really credit needs to be given to the work of Sonoma Clean Power uh, and their formation in. Um, uh, 2012 and then service starting in 2014 uh, that has helped dramatically bring down the greenhouse gas impact of our local energy consumption. Uh, so throughout all this, Sonoma Clean Power is one of those uh, key partners that we will have been and will continue to work with. Next slide, please. Uh, so here wanted to talk a little bit about kind of where we see the aspects, the main aspects of this action plan. Um, and wanted to, um, um, there is currently work being done right now by the Bay Area Regional Energy Network. Uh, they have just released an RFP or are releasing an RFP looking for consultants that will be doing a, a building inventory stock of the entire Bay Area, the nine county Bay Area. We will be using the Sonoma County information uh, from that study to really help guide uh, efforts locally. Uh, and that's an attempt to look at uh, how many structures, residential, commercial, public, industrial, how many structures are there in the county? Uh, what are their vintages? When were they built? Uh, the, based upon when they were built, we can make some assumptions about their overall energy efficiency and potential appliances. Uh, so we're going to be working uh, uh, with Bayren on that existing building stock analysis. Um, second, uh, we're going to be developing a community engagement and equity uh, framework, which will uh, be allow us to kind of help guide us in uh, going out and getting some uh, uh, feedback and review on a lot of this stuff and kind of uh, trying to get input from at a community level. 
Uh, we see a lot of potential here coming out of our climate protection initiative and some of the social equity work that's been done around that um, and trying to build upon um, kind of that work. Um, and then um, wanted to, this overall report, and I mentioned this before, really is going to focus both on existing buildings and on new construction. So really kind of trying, if we're successful, trying to look at all building types, kind of all improvements needed across all building types. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so with a specific focus then on where we will be, um, kind of our efforts are going to be put over the next two years on this project. Um, my initial proposal at this point is for moving into 2024, starting in January, we'll really be focusing on the existing buildings piece, uh, forming a um, some sort of an existing buildings working group uh, made up of jurisdictional staff and also trying to think about how to include kind of uh, community input, not necessarily the um, social equity input, but I'm thinking of, say, uh, 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 trained professionals or those working in the building energy field that really have some input here, uh, groups like Building Decarbonization Coalition and groups like that. Um, so we're really going to focus first on the existing buildings and then looking at 2025, the next uh, round of uh, building code standards will be released in 2024 for adoption or actually will be released and will be worked on throughout 2024 and 2025 uh, with them going into effect on December 31st, 25. Uh, and we are hoping then to align our work across jurisdictions on thinking about um, a reach codes, all electric reach codes, um, and the variations on that across jurisdictions, looking at that next code cycle change. Uh, many of you are aware that there is current lawsuit against the city of Berkeley uh, that has raised a number of questions on a specific type of uh, these reach codes uh, on the municipal um, kind of muni municipal powers of these reach codes. It has not it is not directly impacting the other reach codes that have been um, adopted through the building code, but it is a big question mark right now and many of us are watching it very carefully. Um, and so kind of based upon those um, kind of link concerns or unknowns around the building codes and the all electric codes, uh, we're taking a little bit of a wait and see approach. Um, I don't want to give the impression that we won't be working on the um, new construction or thinking about building codes at all in the next year. Um, I think I might have given that impression at our board meeting. Uh, we are actually meeting, uh, we're working very closely with the Bay Rens Codes and Standards Program, and we'll actually be meeting with Christine Condon uh, at the Climate Action and Resili Resiliency Division with the county um, in early January to start to kind of strategize our longer term plan. Um, so with that, uh, we can go to the next slide. And I think that's the end. I want to say thank you. And um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, wanted to see if there's any questions or feedback uh, that Tanya and I um, should have in mind as we take our next steps. So thank you. Great. Thank you, BC. Does anybody have any questions? Um, this is Carrie. I had uh, one quick question, just looking at the report, page nine. Um, the federal IRA funding, can you just briefly outline what that is and when that's coming now? I, so I can in brief, uh, I do not have the detailed information and that is something that I think that um, others have been tracking and I need to have my finger more on that pulse. In general, as I understand, there's a number of, uh, there's a, a large amount of funding that's been earmarked at the federal level the majority of that funding is being allocated to the states. The state is then developing programs that are in um, various stages of development at this point with RFPs and um, kind of notice of funding availability to be released over the course of the next couple of years. Um, so uh, I am not tracking that kind of at the minute level, um, but my general feeling is that it's really right now that it is at the state level and the development of programs, which then would then be re released, um, kind of announced over the course of 2024. Um, and we wanna make sure we're in a line um, either uh, to to, um, uh, to capitalize that on some way. Great, thank you. Um, just as a little bit of a 
a slide I actually had a conversation about uh, with a small business owner in Sebastopol yesterday. He brought it up about, uh, you know, he'd like to uh, do solar panels and become more electric at his office building um, with the idea of, hey, you know, if we were able to put solar panels over parking, like the big, you know, Kaisers and whatnot are able to do, we could actually, you know, do a lot there. Um, just as a little bit of a input as you're thinking about it. So I think there is, you know, he, from his perspective, he's a small business owner. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of cash to spend on that kind of capital improvement, but he has a willingness to do it if there's assistance out there for that. Very good. I am. Um... I'm not aware of th anything specifically right now, but I will um, I'll see if I can connect those dots and at least um, um, send resources your way that are available at the at this point. Great, thanks. Any other questions for BC? Comments on the item? All right, thank you, BC. Hey, great, thank you. Again, apologize. I wish I could be there with y'all, but uh, uh, happy holidays and happy New Year. We'll move on to item five on the agenda, and I think that's Ms. Martin. That's right. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the community-based transportation plan program. So let me bring up some slides here. And it's just a quick introduction. Uh, the community-based transportation plans is an evolution of what was once called the Lifeline Transportation Program. And it's really focused on getting uh, transportation agencies, including transit providers, uh, agencies like SCTA, local jurisdictions together with the community, and in particular, uh, disadvantaged communities and identifying transportation gaps and issues in those communities uh, with the intent to, to create a list of projects and improvements that can be worked on and implemented over time. Uh, so, um, so SETA has done a bit of this planning in the past. It's a regional program uh, funded by MTC. So we work very closely with MTC on this. Uh, and there's a new round of funding available over the next two or three years. And so we've looked at the maps and we're intending to do some planning exercises in Santa Rosa and Roner Park uh, through 2024 and 2025. So just a little bit about the uh, the program, so like I said before, it's really intended to improve access and mobility for underserved and marginalized communities. Uh, there's a geographic focus of the program. So uh, MTC has identified disadvantaged communities, communities of concern, or equity priority communities over time. So the focus has generally been on those geographic areas, uh, which we have a number here in Sonoma County. Um, the process is really to engage the community to identify barriers and issues, uh, and then work on coming up with some potential improvements. And like I have here, the goal is to have a list of community identified transportation projects and solutions that can be worked on over time. Uh, and MTC is identifying funding to help implement some of those improvements as well. So here's a current list or a map of equity priority communities in Sonoma County. Uh, you can see uh, the purple areas. There's quite a concentration in central and southern Santa Rosa, uh, Central Lerner Park, the Springs area in the unincorporated county just north of Sonoma, and then the river area, Fish River area. So many geographic opportunities there. Uh, I mentioned that we'd uh, drafted a number of community-based transportation plans in the past. Uh, the first was a plan um, put together for the Roseland area of Santa Rosa that was completed in 2009, so relatively dated at this point. Uh, but subsequent plans were uh, assembled for the Russian River area, the Sonoma Valley area in Springs, and Central Healdsburg. Uh, so the process involved a lot of public meetings, SETA staff and consulting staff, you know, tabling at grocery stores and other places like that and identifying issues. Most of uh, so the types of projects that were identified as part of an outreach and the work were things like improving transit stops and routes, right? Uh, and one of the um, improvements or one of the outcomes of the Roseland plan was actually new transit service in the Roseland area. 
in uh, southwest intervals. Up. So also improved frequencies for transit, improving bicycle and pedestrian routes and facilities, making sidewalk connections. You know, in a lot of these areas, the connections are pretty rough, right? They're spotty sidewalk um, infrastructure, improved travel information and safety improvements as well. There are a lot of crashes in some of these areas. Uh, so here's a look at that uh, South Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa Avenue corridor or equity priority community that uh, we'll be looking at uh, starting next year. Um, this is roughly an area bounded on the north by Highway 12 um, along Santa Rosa Avenue down to Mountain View Avenue, just north of it. So it includes incorporated city and unincorporated areas. There are over 10,000 people and over 3,500 households in this area. So, um, and um, most of that's actually concentrated along Santa Rosa Avenue. 50% uh, of the households are lower income, 60% uh, are minority populations. And you're all probably familiar with this, this area. There's a mix of housing, commercial, and industrial land uses there. And, you know, the connections are pretty fragmented, right? It's, you know, easy, relatively easy to get around in a car, but if you're walking or biking, um, you know, there are gaps in the, the sidewalks and the, the, the bike lanes and things like that. So I uh, want to be able to work with that community to address and identify some of those issues and some solutions there. Uh, so moving to Central Rotor Park, this is an area that hasn't shown up in the past as part of one of these equity areas, but it popped up as part of the last uh, round of analysis. And, you know, this is in Central Rotor Park, centered on Rotor Park Expressway and State Farm Drive um, near the... Um, you know, State Farm site is, is in that area, so a lot of opportunities there. Again, it's pretty heavily populated with over 10,000 people and over 4,000 households. About a third of the residents or households are low income and over 50% are minority population in this area. So again, it's really a mix of housing and commercial industrial areas there. And there are a lot of, um, you know, disconnects or fragmented connections between where people live and where they want to live in this area. So here's the rough scope and timeline of what we'll be doing. Uh, we're working on an RFP right now. Uh, we're hoping to kick that off in February. So we'll be taking a, a presentation to our board to introduce our work and get their blessing to reduce or release an RFP to get a consultant on board to help with this um, in February. Uh, a really important part of this is to establish a stakeholder committee. So we wanna have representatives from Rona Park, the county, Santa Rosa, um, but also transit providers, right? And um, folks uh, building bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure to be able to guide the process uh, and to help develop that community outreach strategy, right? Like how can we get, you know, how can we communicate with people that, you know, don't typically show up at our public meetings, right? And figure, find out what uh, transportation issues that are dealing with are. Uh, so that's the next step, having that community outreach strategy, we'll work with a consultant to develop that, uh, and then um, go through a round of outreach and community meetings to really come up with a list, right? Like what are gaps and barriers? Um, and you can take a look at a few of our older CBTPs to see kind of a list of what's popped up before. Uh, as part of our last comprehensive transportation plan, we did a countywide look at um, you know, issues people are contending with. So there's a list there as well. Uh, so that's the first step um, is identifying what the issues are and then working with the stakeholders and also the community to come up with some ideas on how to, you know, address those gaps and barriers, right? Come up with some solutions, including projects, right? Like maybe bus stop improvements at certain areas would make a difference. Maybe, you know, addressing a sidewalk gap would make a difference or having cross crossing improvements in certain areas. So coming up with that list with the stakeholders and the community, um, prioritizing it, getting that into a plan, and then presenting the findings to stakeholders, community groups, and elected officials. So that's the final outcome to have a plan, um, the keystone of which is that list <laughs> of prioritized improvements. Um, and then presenting that and having that available when funding becomes available to help, you know, implement some of those improvements. So these are the kind of outcomes we want to see from the program. You know, like I've said a number of times, a list of community-identified projects, 
uh, the list of issues and barriers, uh, but also to discuss potential funding sources for these projects, right, uh, that we know of now. Um, and then the final report summary. Uh, this is a, a rough outline of how we'd like to conduct outreach, um, have community meetings, including pop-up, um, you know, engagement at different areas in the uh, study areas. Public hearings, you know, our STA board meetings and advisory committees will have a project website. Uh, there are a number of things that we've done in the past, including surveys, but also map-based surveys where people can draw pins or points and talk about issues. Uh, and then we'll have draft reports and we'll be taking comments on those documents as well. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. Uh, like I said, we're just finalizing the RFP documents for this and hoping to get that out uh, in February uh, and kicking work off uh, thereafter. And we'll be working with Runner Park, Santa Rosa, and the county on the timing and everything. We certainly would uh, like each of those stakeholders involved in you know, reviewing consultant um, proposals if they're available and also helping to guide the project. So um, yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know kind of where we're at right now uh, this funding comes up every three or four years or so. So as new funding becomes available, we'll be able to look at other parts of the county as well. Um, and if your community doesn't show up as an equity priority community, we have looked at things countywide in the past as well. So there are opportunities to do that as well. And if you're interested in that type of analysis, if you look at um, a few of the appendices in our comprehensive transportation plan that was adopted in 2021, there's a whole section that goes through the outreach, including graphs of you know, the priority issues and types of things uh, folks are facing, and also a list of the um, projects that were identified in the prior CTPs or CBTPs and kind of where they're at. And was able to go through and kind of see if we've made any progress or you know, been able to chip away at those previous objectives. So a lot of information for plans, uh, our CTP, and then working on two additional plans. So just wanted to let the group know kind of where that's at, what the schedule is, and look forward to working on that going forward. And we'll be able to come back with, with updates to this group on kind of how that's going and yeah, the results. Great, thank you, Chris. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I've got at least a couple. So for the area, it looked like the area, there's a pretty large unincorporated area west of Runner Park. Is that Graydon or? Let me bring up. Oh. So it's actually bordered by 101. If on you go west. up one more time. Oh, okay. To the south Santa Rosa. Uh, one more time. The whole county. <laughs> county. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Let's see. The one with the purple areas, right? So Graydon is about right there. So this area is just south of Hearn, down to just- So basically the, Moreland all the way- Exactly. West yeah. until 116 or- Yeah, okay. and the area all the way over to um, Sebastopol. Yeah, a lot so. of that is Laguna, but it would include like the Todd Road and Yano areas. Okay, and then in terms of uh, the ultimate product, is this going to be one plan with multiple sections, or does each area get its own? Each plan will have its own okay. document. So our plan is to get one consultant on, on board that will kind of manage both, you know, planning exercises, but to have a separate document for the Runner Park area and then the South San Jose. And then just one comment, you know, I think the biggest opportunity for efficiencies is particularly with, um, uh, Santa Rosa taking the lead on the South Santa Rosa specific plan that's due to kick off. Um, a lot of overlap. Yeah, we're already coordinating on that. We have a monthly meeting set up to kind of make sure we're not scheduling community meetings at the same time and that we can use the same dates, right, and have um, outreach focused on this effort, the South Santa Rosa plan, the general plan, and the uh, Santa Rosa active transportation plan all happening at the same place and time. So yeah, there's a lot going on and we know there's a lot of survey fatigue and outreach fatigue. So we're trying to minimize that. Thanks for bringing that up. It's really important. And we're gonna try and minimize that as much as possible. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? 
So Chris, I just wanted to add to Scott's points about um, how this effort engages and leverages the active transportation plan, which are ongoing right now. Uh, some of the past work, Vision Zero, LRSP, there's just a lot of information that I think would be a shame if it wasn't brought in. Yeah, and that, you know, I think that should be a key part of the scope is reviewing the existing documents and yeah. pulling all that outreach in that's already right? exactly. reflecting that as part of the we've heard this already right yeah because yeah, that i mean to, to, your, yeah, 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 to yeah. your point about outreach fatigue uh you know people are really frustrated if they share their opinions and then it does they don't see it reflected back to them yeah so i think that's critical yeah. and then what we found with our you know recent atp process is the map based surveys were hugely helpful with getting very specific yeah. input so i would absolutely encourage that being part of the scope of the scope of the and that's been a big part of the active transportation plan. So yeah, definitely think we can make that happen. Great. All right, anything else for Chris on item five? <clears throat> I will right, we'll move on to uh, item six. And uh, that one's Mr. Barney as well. Yeah, that's the BMT project, right? So um, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> 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 so um yeah, as, as most of you know, we were actually able to receive grant funding from Caltrans to um, continue working on EMT um, analysis and SP743 implementation. Uh, in the past, we've produced maps and summaries. We um, worked with the consultant to develop the, the BMT mitigation and reduction calculator. Uh, and kind of the next step is to look at a BMT mitigation banking exchange or fee program. So uh, there's a little bit of movement happening in this area across the state right now. Probably between 10 or 15 jurisdictions are actively kind of looking at how something like this would be implemented. Uh, and the idea is that um, when looking at projects, whether it's a development project or a transportation project, uh, the identified on-site mitigations will you know, probably not get you all the way to where you want to go when you're trying to reduce and mitigate EMT. So there's a little bit of information associated with that. CAPCO has been active in this area, Fair and Peers, a few other groups. And, you know, how much EMT reduction is possible on site or in the vicinity. Um, but it's starting to look like that won't get you to where you want to be when you're looking at recommended statewide BMT thresholds and the thresholds that are being adopted at the local level. So uh, there's a need for another mechanism to fund offsite improvements. So that's where we get to a banking exchange or fee program. Uh, so bank would be, banks and fee programs are similar, you know, the setup and kind of legal basis is a little different, but basically what would happen is the project sponsor would pay into some sort of larger pot of money that could be used to fund BMT reducing projects off-site, right? Whether it's within a jurisdiction or within a county or a greater region. Um, so there, yeah, a lot of moving parts associated with that, but it would be similar to other banking programs across the state. And then exchange programs, a little different. So the way that would work is there'd be a pre-existing list of BMT reducing projects that a project sponsor could choose from to help implement to offset their mitigation. So for example, if there's a large housing development, uh, there could be a list of 10 or so, you know, bicycle pedestrian improvements or transit improvements or travel demand management programs that they could pay into or help implement to offset their BMT mitigations. So that's how these programs basically look. So um, what we'd like to figure, you know, we'd like to have some information on what would be appropriate for Sonoma County, what BMT reducing projects would look like, um, and how we could actually implement this in the county, including who the implementing agency would be, whether it's Sonoma, you know, SCTA, or another organization. Um, so we have this grant funding, so we're working on getting a consultant on board to help provide some recommendations for a program for Sonoma County. Um, so part of that is identifying programs that have been studied. I don't think anyone anything's actually been implemented yet, but studied in codes and other locations. So build on work that's already gone ahead. Uh, get stakeholders together, including you all at the planning level, the public works level as well, but also community representatives and the development community, right? <laughs> 
on what would work for them um, and other, you know, unintended consequences or, you know, impact. So, uh, and then, you know, evaluate what would work in our community here, what's been proposed in places like LA or San Jose may not be exactly appropriate for Sonoma County, the scale is different. Um, and then outline a path to implementation, right? Like if we identify what the right, the right program is, how do we actually set it up and who would administer it and how can we maintain it over time? So um, I've included the scope of work in the agenda packet along with a um, preliminary schedule <laughs> for the project. So just to walk through the scope of work really um, briefly, the first step is consult procurement. We're looking at releasing the RFP uh, early January <clears throat> with proposals due in, in February and hoping to take um, a recommendation to our board in March so we can get going with the project uh, in early March. Uh, the next step, once we get a consultant on board, is to get together a project technical advisory committee. So we'd like to have reps from your agencies, um, also the development community and other interested parties to help guide the project um, that we and the con consultants can work with to make sure we're meeting the needs of everyone and getting some gut checks and feedback on um, the deliverables. Uh, another piece is developing an outreach plan. So how do we engage different groups, right? Like what's the best way to talk to the development community about what the requirements are and what would work for them? Uh, working with community-based organizations in the community um, and also the public. And then identifying key issues, you know, including things like legal requirements, including things like additional additionality, you know, like if you have a project, um, and it's being funded or it was going to happen anyway, you can't take credit for that uh, as part of one of these mitigation programs. So um, there will definitely be a component of checking in with legal counsel, both on the consultant side, but also the local, um, all of your legal counsel with what they would be comfortable with. <laughs> sure. um, so we need to look at the effectiveness of the interiors and projects and, you know, tearing off of our BMT reduction calculator and other research, uh, cost effectiveness, what's the biggest thing for the buck, the geographic scope, right? Um, so if a project is paying into a bank, for example, uh, would that money need to be spent, spent within the jurisdiction or could it go elsewhere, right? Like that's a big question to work through. Um, equity impacts is important, uh, administration, and then other key issues. So there are a lot of moving parts and, and details that need to be worked out. Uh, so I think at the conceptual level, we're understanding this a little better, but yeah, a lot to work through uh, as we move forward. Uh, so the next step is uh, coming up with some options and draft recommendations. So we hope to have those by November of next year. So hopefully we can stick to that. Uh, and then after that, we'd like to um, include some sort of pilot program where we do testing, right? Um, it could be past projects, conceptual projects, or actual projects that are actually, you know, taking that proposed program and walking it through the process and seeing what the results look like and seeing if it would work. So we'll definitely need to work with that guiding committee or steering committee on, you know, what types of projects to analyze. <laughs> um, so just to make sure that what's proposed would work. And then based on that pilot, you know, testing and stress testing. Uh, come back with final recommendations in September of 2025. So that's kind of our pathway forward. So, you know, I think there's a pretty good chance we can have, you know, some draft recommendations next year, but, you know, the testing and everything uh, will be important. So we're probably a year and a half to two years out until we're actually closer to implementation. But, you know, this is a it's a big process and it has nothing's been implemented yet across the state. So I think it's prudent to kind of walk through and um, take our time and make sure something will work. And, you know, I'm, I'm also confident that if we implement something here in Sonoma County, it'll need to be adjusted and changed over time uh, once we get something in place as we and other counties and other areas are going through. So, yeah, there's been, you know, quite a bit of interest from the consultant community on this. So we'll see how
how many good <laughs> proposals we'll get. But if you're interested in having someone from your um, agency participate in the consultant selection panel, let me know. We'll be getting that together next month. Uh, so, and you know, the, the time commitment for that would be reviewing, I wouldn't expect more than five proposals and then being part of the consultant selection panel. So, you know, probably a day and a half to two days of the total work. So, yeah, so that's where we're at right now. Um, Love to get any feedback on the scope and the, the schedule or any specific needs at this time. Um, there'll be a chance to do a lot of, you know, fine tuning once we get a consultant on board. <laughs> but um, yeah, as much as we can include in the RFP right now ahead of time would be very helpful to make sure we're getting everything that you all would like to see from the program. Yeah. Any questions or comments right now? I guess I'll take one. I, mean, I, I think that the um, uh, for the bank to idea to be the most successful, I think that crossing jurisdictional boundaries is important. You know, if you look at something like the, the wine industry, you know, um, bike racks at a winery um, aren't really, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but in terms of, you know, uh, you know, the agricultural community, you know, that is, you know, a big part of the jobs market. People are living in the cities and they're driving out to the unincorporated county for, for work. And it's bringing visitors in from, from all over. And, um, you know, I think that if we're going to get the most out of, you know, uh, developers who, you know, have a financial interest in being able to meet SQL requirements, I think that, um, that link between you know unincorporated into incorporated is going to be one of the most critical things, um, and you know as much as I'd like to say yeah it should stay in the county because I'm the county and that's what I care about. You know I think if we are trying to make meaningful progress and have a su successful yeah. program, we do need it to cross those jurisdictional boundaries. Yeah, that's great. You know I think that'll be less of a problem here in Sonoma County. That's much more of an issue I think in other counties or other areas. But yeah, I, I agree. I think it's going to fall down that that way. And thanks for bringing up visitors as well. So that's that's an issue in our county specifically that may not be as much of an issue as places like Contra Costa and other things, right? So um, yeah, I'm going to include at least a few lines in our scope that visitor travel and visitor interaction we consider <laughs> as part of the proposals in the plan. Chris, I think this is great. We're actually working on our VMT thresholds projects right now, and actually I'm kind of pushing to have some discussion of some things. I think some of the things that would be helpful to make sure it's not just the physical improvements, but there's some operational stuff, like, I mean, for us, the, you know, bus funding, the city contributes to an electric bus, which is, <laughs> but, you know, I don't know if that's sustainable for the city, but it is potentially something from a bank to, or for Sonoma County Transit kind of support. Um, and then, you know, I think about sort of very old school, like car share programs and things like that, that, you know, could help with that. Um, and I'm thinking about it as a community, obviously that doesn't have the transit stop, so how else could we do it? Um, or in those places, you know, like you're looking at um, a couple agenda items ago in the equity communities, like, would a car share be helpful? You know, some stuff like that is where you could, you know, look at those things. Yeah, you know, I think we can be creative, right? <laughs> <laughs> at least at the stakeholder level when we're discussing things with the consultant, you know, getting a lot of things on the table. And Dan and I have talked about travel demand management. We're planning on putting together a travel demand management plan. Uh, sometime in the next year or so it's actually called out in our go sonoma transportation sales tax measure um to have something like that so this program could um help fund some of those travel programs so yeah so I yeah think i think that that kind of like what are those programs and what could they be we um we have in our code you can ask for parking reduction if you have a travel demand program, we have had someone apply for that yeah. and they had, you know, what those ideas are and, you know, showers, bicycles, they were right on the Joe Rito Trail. Um, 
but yeah, right now we're actually, we just released a draft EIR for a project on the north side of town. First time we've done BMT in a sort of bigger thing like this. And okay, based on density that we're talking about reduction, you know, that the density would reduce um, trips. And it was like, well, but would it really? Because you know, the fact that it's on a right on the West County Trail might reduce trips if there's a way and they have a lot of bicycle stuff in there. But if you still have one bus an hour, is that really, you know, is the density really going to matter in, in terms of the BMT? And so really looking at what those practical will actually have impact, not just what CAPCOA says as possibilities. Yeah, that's a, it's a big issue right now, the defensibility, right? There's such a yeah. uh, lack of research on what really is effective and data and information to back it up. So, yeah, I think that check-in with the legal community will be really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about programs, too, what is, what's legal to include, right? <laughs> so um, I see that as a pretty important component of all of this is getting their buy-off, or at least a sense of their comfort level with um, what would be happening here. Great. And I would be interested in talking to you about the review of the proposed stuff. That'd be great. And maybe in exchange, because we have a sustainable transportation grant. That sounds up like too. Really <laughs> <good idea. laughs> I could use another review. And I know uh, Santa Rosa has also expressed interest in review proposals too, so I right. appreciate that. You'd be interested in helping too. Okay, great. Great. Well, thank you. I would just echo uh, a lot of the comments that were made today. I think the cross jurisdiction is the way. I mean, it's the only way it's really going to work. We can't live in our silos and actually try to reduce BMTs given all the points that have been made. Um, I think our transit operators are going to be key partners in this. Uh, there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening with mobility shuttles. Uh, so looking at how you could kind of broaden out options for uh, alternative transportation, I think some of the things we're looking at, but not just uh, bike and ped, but also some of the more you know traditional transit or newer transit options. Um, and there is some kind of cross uh, pollination with these ideas with some of the stormwater mitigation where you know you, you might have some stormwater impacts on the development site and you fund another stormwater mitigation project. So there are examples of this and that's been done cross-jurisdictionally within the county. That's something to think about. Um, and then also, I think it's a good idea to kind of mine uh, some of the things we've already talked about, but mine some of the past efforts. So like our climate action plans have, have uh, policies that talk about some of these things and reminding us and our decision makers of those uh, and the communities, again, just gets back to that feedback loop. We heard this, and this is a mechanism and opportunity to implement some of these things to also get broader and, and multi benefit elements. Yeah, we have a lot of resources, right? The active transportation plan, the short range transit plans that the transit providers put together, mm -hmm. our, our general plans, right? Yeah. Our comprehensive transportation plan. Yeah, thanks. I'll make sure that we include a literature review yes exactly <laughs> exactly yeah great thank you sir uh moving on to item seven dana do you have an update for us on atp um it's actually on uh the bike share program oh i'm sorry bike, bike share i'm yeah. excited about the atp so i'm excited yeah. about both <laughs> um, <laughs> so just a little a little background for those of you who have been watching this over the last years but uh, many years but um the CTA and the Transportation Authority of New England uh, jointly received a grant from MTC for a bike share pilot program. Um, in 2020, we contracted with uh, an operator and worked with them closely to um, on a program throughout both counties, really focused around the, the smart station areas. And um, unfortunately, that company um, went out of business. So this uh, summer and fall, we did a new procurement and we brought a proposed contract to our board um, with the company that the panel recommended called Draw Mobility. Um, and that was at our board meeting in December and our, um, our board did approve that. So we are getting ready to uh, 
get started working with Draw Mobility on a, a program that is set up very similarly to what we were working on previously, um, 300 pedal electric assist bikes um, along the corridor in cities from Larkspur through Santa Rosa, um, connecting smart stations to key areas um, in the downtown vicinity. And um, it's a two-year pilot program and or two year two years of operations. We're expecting about a six month time frame to uh, to do the planning and get everything up and running. Um, so looking at a launch uh, this coming summer. And um, let's see what else uh, should I mention here? We um, yeah the the operator will kind of take care of all the necessary. Um, elements to develop and operate the system. So uh, looking at warehousing, um, establishing a, an operating team that's local um, to rebalance and maintain the bicycles. Um, they do have a, a call center um, and um, an app that you, know, you can rent the bicycles through that will be, it's essentially white labeled. So we'll need to come up with some branding, um, a name and and, and branding around it. Um, they will, you know, work closely with us on outreach and marketing and relations for the program. Um, and we'll have kind of a suite of membership options, the, um, like a pay-as-you-go, monthly, annual programs, as well as an equity program. Um, and uh, let's see, there's like a, a 90 10 uh, revenue split um, where the you know ninety percent of the fees and memberships go back to the company and and we retain ten percent and so that can go into um, either system expansion during that pilot program period or um, possibly extension of the program after that. Um, so just on the on these stuff, do you anticipate that it'll be revenue neutral or what are you yeah. thinking right now? Um, so, you know, there's, there's been a lot of different models of bike share that have come and gone and, um, you know, really all the, all the research is saying that most of the time, um, it, bike sharing needs subsidy just as, you know, transit and roads do as well. Um, and, you know, except for very few, like very dense, large cities that, you know, have it in the revenue model. Um, so you know our grant will cover that subsidy, our grant plus um, you know user fees and some advertising subsidies will cover that uh, you know two initial two year pilot period. Um, you know to continue the program after that we would need additional funding. So um, you know some of those some of that revenue that we hold could help offset that, but um, you know, assuming that it's a successful pilot, we'll be looking for, um, you know, opportunities for like a VMT mitigation bank. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, it's, it's, it's interesting. Our yeah. climate action committee has actually talked about, um, well, they were approached by Sweden folks. Uh -huh. Um, and what they actually kind of, after discussions determined was that, you know, just given the demographics of Sebastopol, which is older, it, you know, skewed older um, and whatnot, that with the topography that potentially e-bikes was a better option. And it was there a way to do a sharing program like that, especially when you look at that kind of last mile of transit of, okay, we have buses that come in but they don't go to the jobs up on the north side of town, which is a kind of a big hill, but you can get there by the West Country Trail. And, you know, how could that be that, filling that gap of that last mile and as someone who used to live in the heart of the Bay Area and had to deal with that, like, you know, it was like getting from, Cal from BART to Caltrans in the city where that link didn't exist and you had to walk mm -hmm. 15 minutes or having to yeah go four or five miles where you weren't really going to do a bfa bicycle so like that kind of thing i see the existence in account too yeah in terms of the, both the smart stations and the buses yeah absolutely 
Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind to me is the uh, smart station near Cotton Town and like the mm -hmm. county center. So we have people that you know take the smart train from Petaluma and then either a shuttle or they brought their bike the whole way and then they store their bike in the office because they don't want to pay for like those pay as you go crates mm -hmm. on, on the mm -hmm. county campus. Um, so I hope it doesn't end up like those unused crates on the county campus. <laughs> And we have a, a Zoom participant, uh, Emily Betts, who's mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, congratulations on getting this approved, Dana. It's an exciting program. Um, <clears throat> we did announce it at our, our board meeting yesterday, too, because I'm constantly getting questions about when the bike share program is starting again. Uh, two questions. Um, do you know if they will be at every smart station, or is that still to be determined? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That is still to be determined. Um, you know, we are recommending that the you know we use kind of the the sites that were had gone through the vetting through both Smart and the the local cities um, during the previous work. Mm -hmm. um, but we you know we're really yet to confirm all of the locations. Um, we do have the same number of bicycles that we were planning for previously, so it is mm -hmm. did, um, okay. they need to prioritize. Okay. Safe. Um, and I also, you probably saw this, but it looks like um, Bird filed for bankruptcy yesterday. So I don't know if they are still operating in Healdsburg or Santa Rosa, but just wanted to mention that. Is that the scooters? Mm -hmm. And we have the bikes in Hillsborough. Oh, you do the bikes too. Yeah, that's all. Congratulations! Thanks for moving this forward. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I just had a question. So, is there anything else um, the participating jurisdictions or partners need to be thoughtful about as differences between what we kind of spent a long time working on and then what we need to be ready for? Because uh, I know we had planned some kind of uh, remote locations in our downtown to. Mm -hmm. it, is that still on the table? Is that different? Yeah, so we are suggesting to the company that they use the same locations, um, certainly to still be approved by the cities, but uh, we are providing the the schematics and the, you know all of the information that we have done previously. So, um, you know, if there are any of those locations that the city no longer wants, you know, start considering that. Okay. Um, and you know, we'll definitely do a thorough review and see if there's anything else that makes sense that we had not thought of before um, that still fits in with the you know, number of bicycles. Um, I'd say one slight difference is this company seems to want to have more um, stations, um, same number of bicycles, but maybe smaller, smaller stations yeah. and more of them. So um we may need to look at some additional locations as well um we plan to convene the the working group um probably late january or maybe in february to start working through these topics great and uh some state as part of that um yeah we've been working with them on on some agreements and um and yeah we'll bring them in as well okay uh, Dana, did you want to just make a point about, uh, I think what came up around the maintenance, um, how it was going to be I think based in Santa Rosa, kind of in-house, and how that was different than mm -hmm. the previous contract where there were some issues around maintaining the, the bikes. Does that ring a bell? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. It's the last contract we haven't actually started operations yet um yeah i think it was it was an example of it i feel like it came from a discussion mm -hmm. just how there was um kind of in-house maintenance that was being planned for for this model whereas other models mm -hmm. often rely on outside vendors yeah to do the maintenance and that often causes an issue and just yeah i want to keep the system going so um, yeah kind of a bonus for Doing it in house, I think. Right? Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, I I guess I was thinking of maintenance, but actually, um, mechanics. But maintenance is both mechanics and rebalancing and battery charging, swapping and all that. Um. So yeah, the the um, 
the operators will actually, the maintenance folks will be employees of the of draw mobility rather than contractors. So I, I know that's you know that's been an issue with um, with bird, um, it's my understanding, and kind of keeping those operations managers. Um, Have you thought about if it could be somehow paired with bicycle shops? So yeah, for local businesses. And yeah. Have them um, by maintenance. Yeah, there's definitely some thoughts around that. One thing that you know we'll need to figure out and consider is you know, we have this very long corridor and that you know under one program, um, you know possibly having a warehouse that's central and then maybe some satellite and maybe the satellites could be um, joined with local bike shops. Um, another area that you know we may want to consider uh, working with local bike shops on is if there are you know, requests for adaptive bikes to be part of the system. Um, it's often really hard to do and kind of at the stations with the other bikes just because of the hardware and technology um, and kind of you know having those adaptive bikes be pulled up to weather but possibly we could uh, partner with local bike shops that have those bikes and do some sort of rental program that's connected with the overall system, but kind of um, operates a little differently. So those are those are some areas that we're kind of cons considering partnering with bike shops. All right, very exciting. Thank you, Dana. Thanks. Uh, so we'll move on to Adam Garcia's so we'll kind of travel model update. Great, great. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, great. So, uh, Adam Garcia, data analyst, SCTR CPA, uh, coming to you with another uh, travel model installment in our series. Uh, we're going to be bringing a lot of these to you. So, this is a really important one. Uh, so as we've gone through in the past, we kind of did an overview of what the travel model is, uh, and looking to the future, we're going to be transitioning, as we discussed, you know, from uh, a more traditional trip-based model to a much more advanced activity-based model. So there's a lot to think about, you know, what do we want to get out of this new travel model system? It ties back to measuring BMTs, as we were saying, that's one of the big um, outputs from being able to look at how a specific development will impact the surrounding uh, transportation system. So what we're going to be talking about today are the, uh, the travel model guidelines. Uh, and so these, this document is really the kind of high level guiding principles to say, what do we want our travel model to do? How, what are the end results ideally we want to get out of this model that can help influence say, for instance, some of these um, uh, ambitious outcomes we want to see in how we move around our cities and um, rural areas, too. So um, the last time, why are we updating the travel model? I think it's been uh, quite a few years since we last updated it. Uh, and so looking to the future for the activity-based model, um, but really want to be able to hear from all of you um, either now or um, in the new year, just around uh, what we can really update and change to, to suit the purposes of, um, uh, of our analysis needs for uh, transportation impacts. Um, so a few of the things that you know, we've updated related to the travel model, for instance, um, is trying to make sure we're capturing those tourism areas. So looking at the different um, uh, main winery areas uh, uh, in Alexander Valley and then uh, the south. Um, thinking about uh, weekend model travel. Um, and so there's, yeah, been a few things we've been updating um, as we've been coming along, but yeah, really looking to, to the big picture of next steps. So 
Uh, what's in the travel model guidelines, we can see uh, just a little bit here around the big picture of how we administer the, uh, the, the guidelines. Um, so again, that's really helpful in trying to think about what services outputs we want to be able to see from the um, from the travel model to be able to inform them, you know, analyzing impacts of projects, understanding how we can take that data and then make informed decisions on how to say reduce impacts of a project or analyze how a larger plan, um, a specific plan for instance, and the, the transportation changes within that, how would those affect um, you know the transportation network. A lot of that is is in that kind of the program administration, but also the second part of the technical and operational policies as well too. Um, so I won't go too much more into that, but we really want to be able to focus on a few questions. Um, hopefully folks have had a chance to just give a quick review of the um, of the administrative guidelines for, for the travel model. Um, if there's any high level questions, we'd be happy to take those right now. Otherwise we can um, kind of just jump into a few of these questions right now. Um, so uh, the first one, uh, let's see, go ahead and see. You got your hand raised. Yeah, um, I would assume that we're gonna base this on the uh, uh, the Air Resources Board goal of a 25% reduction in VMT by uh, 2030, <clears throat> but will the model be available in time to implement that? <clears throat> yeah, let's see. So the the model right now, as it stands, can can do those types of analysis. Um, it doesn't have specific thresholds, from what I understand, around reduction. It, it more measures the impact of those projects. So. Um, yeah, Chris, maybe you can follow up on this if you want, but my understanding is that it's more of a tool to analyze the impacts rather than one to um, really actually enforce any particular um, reductions uh, to meet those statewide targets. Right. And, you know, Steve, that's something that the state will need to actually address and you know, come up with some ways of meeting their their goals. You know, we're certainly considering that as we do, you know, engage in all these other planning exercises. And as we update our next comprehensive transportation plan, you know, that's something we can kind of chip away at there. But, you know, today the intent for the travel model administrative and technical guidelines is really to look at the philosophy of, you know, why do we have a model? What do we use it for? And is it meeting SETA's needs and local agency as well? So, you know, the documents, you know, 10 to 15 pages talking about that high level stuff, right? You know, why do we have it? How do we use it? How should we update it? So it's useful to everyone, right? So definitely appreciate the comment. And yeah, that's, um, you know, something we can use the model for, but, you know, that's, you know, it's a tool, right? That's kind of a bigger question that this tool and other tools and other information can be used to address. Well, huh. my own view of this is that uh, other counties are far behind us in terms of uh, focusing on reducing VMT and that whatever we do is going to turn out to be a model for other people. So I think we should keep that in mind. Yeah, I agree with Steve, yeah. And I think that kind of maybe gets to our first question. You know, what are ICTA's planning priorities? They are broad, right? Um, there are many of them. How can the travel model be used to support those? So as I mentioned, we look we for larger projects, uh, development projects specifically, but also specific area plans, general plans. We can use the model to say, given the proposed transportation improvements or changes, uh, specifically, you know, could be to bus routes, it could be to what we have right now are kind of roads and I guess class one bikeways. You know, that's what the travel model can do. Is that enough to, you know, support our efforts in the future? Interesting. 
questions first. Is that enough? Just me measuring those types of um, area plans? And, you know, the one thing I might propose is trying to think about, you know, alternative means of transportation. How can we measure micro mobility in class two, class four bikeway speed? You know, these are ways to try to push the model a little bit further to say, how can we actually do a better job representing all of those, you know, little individuals within the activity-based model? Um, so, Adam, so on, just to on that, that in yeah. terms of, yeah, using, um, obviously we all just finished our housing elements or are finishing them in the Certified. certified. Um, we have site inventories in there. Are those the types of things that, you know, you'd be able to, we have the pipeline of projects that are actually being proposed and we're gonna work through the process, but for the next eight years, we have a whole inventory. Like I know the county recently had over in, I think it's great, and some meetings about, you know, because there are some sites there that would be kind of changing and growth opportunities. Um, are those things that will be kind of incorporated into the model in any way or just pipelines? Uh, yeah, let's see. So the, the housing inventory data, especially the um, you know, inventory as well as proposed projects or those sites um, would be included in the model. Uh, the, within the model scenario, there's existing conditions and then kind of our future scenarios and mm -hmm. plan to fifty and the general plan build out. So for the kind of uh, future sites, the housing opportunity sites that haven't been developed, those would go into the um, kind of future scenarios. Okay. So we can start to see, you know, we recognize those aren't built yet, but recognize in general and build out what would those impacts be. Um, so that'll be part of, uh, yeah, my my new year. <laughs> I was asking you guys about that data, gathering it and plugging it into our kind of future scenario model. Um, it brings up another question though, and Chris, maybe you can help with this, just around, is the travel model ever used to analyze um, those housing element opportunity sites at maybe some programmatic EIR level, or is that in, in the in the city site? Yeah, it definitely can be. I know it was used for the county um, housing element update. I believe Baron Pierce used it. So that, that sounds right. right. Yeah, and I would say I mean, we direct all of our traffic. Uh, analysis to, to use your model. I mean, we think yeah. you guys have the yeah. most up-to-date, accurate information for mm -hmm. your modeling. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if this is the exact right time or, or but but to uh, Carrie's point about BMT reduction and some of the assumptions that are going into mitigation measures right now, uh, being able to actually quantify if that's real or not is, a, I think, a critical piece that, that we're struggling with. It's some of the the BMT assumptions that go into uh, traffic modeling or, or traffic analysis are counterintuitive. So increased density reduces BMT is one of them. Uh, and then also nailing down a, 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 a percentage of uh, commercial development to go into a mixed use project that allows some BMT reduction. Mm -hmm. That's a super interesting thing that as the push for residential is kind of overwhelming all other types of development, you know, as a, as a, a small city, we want to be able to provide amenities to people who are living there and making those amenities walkable and on site are really the best way to reduce BMT. But what we find is every, there's no uh, prescribed kind of formula that says once you get over 10%, 15%, 20% of your floor area as commercial, then you get X, Y, or Z reduction in BMT. Like, I don't know if the model's a, a right place to try to figure that out, but it definitely seems like understanding what the assumptions are and then tracking a project after it's built and, and trying to see the reality would be a huge opportunity because that's what we're struggling with. And, uh, you know, developers right now can now build residential in zone districts. So having some tool 
to try to get some commercial amenities back into our commercial zones uh, is super beneficial to local jurisdictions. Like, like I said, I don't know if the model is a good a, a good place for that, but I definitely think you guys who are running at it and, and managing it, being thoughtful about that, uh, it would be helpful. Absolutely, that's a great use case. To the question of, you know, is you know, just class one enough or do we look at class three or four? I mean, I feel like I have a resounding maybe. <laughs> like, I, you know, I think there's always, um, you know, a preference to include as much data as possible, but if including that extra stuff makes it so it's now taking like two days to like compile the model for like one like yeah. report. Um, maybe that's not as useful as, you know, having a bit less, but knowing that we can, you know, do it in a day or, or half a day or something like that and still get, you know, 93% of, of the result we would have gotten if it took two or three times longer. So um, just from like an upkeep and maintenance perspective, I think that's a big part of like how much you actually include and whether that, you know, last bit is worth, you know, potential exponential time increases. Right, like Sheros on a very small residential street, it kind of doesn't matter if you have Sheros or not. If it's a small street, a certain amount of people are going to choose that street. So, you know, like, does that need to be in the model or not? Compared to the yeah, the bike lanes on street or the the trails. Right, no, that's great, and I think yeah, that maybe rolled into our second question just around you know maintaining the data. You know, at this point, what we're really looking at is what we've talked about, um, the, the proposed and existing land uses, um, you know, class one bikeways, and then all the transportation network that includes, you know, the, the bus routes, um, and then the road network, which is, yeah, a lot of turn lanes and a um, uh, number of lanes, uh, various details in there. So. We tend to update that information, you know, as I think uh, in this next, I think every like three or four years, I guess, when we update the model, just kind of send that out and say, hey, does this look all right? But there's also opportunities as those improvements are made, you know, to, to be able to update the model as well, too. So I think that's a great point. As, as we try to track, you know, more transportation routes, for instance, um, you know, being able to make sure that that's adequately maintained and accurate becomes yet yeah, increasingly challenging. So uh, at this point, yeah, I think we're, we try to do a good job and then, you know, figure out if there's a project when we're, it is going through review if the results of that analysis kind of come out wonky or something looks wrong, we're always, you know, able to go and look into to the data and, and update it. So. so, in response to your question, in, in my experience, you guys do a great job of keeping the development information up to date. You're, yeah. you're regularly acquiring and, and making sure the list is up to date and super responsive. And we really appreciate it. Yeah. The one thing I don't know, I can't speak to, is how much the public works projects get folded in. So I don't know. I mean, I know you guys coordinate with them. <laughs> yeah, it's a slower burn because. There are fewer improvements that are happening on the yeah. public work side, but um, as Adam said, we as we're updating the model for our comprehensive transportation plan, we check in with the engineering public works uh, staff okay. to make sure that we've got any you know road diets right yeah. or expansions things like that. Okay. So, but for the big projects that are happening, you know, as we hear about those from our projects team or our TAC meeting, we can go in and just do those real time. And as the models being used for different projects, a lot of times the consultant will be doing some work and say, hey, this has changed updating the model. So we'll, stuff will happen kind of iteratively all the time yeah. too. That's so, but yeah, every three or four years, there's a effort to have those reviewed yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in greater detail. Okay. So yeah, from my perspective, you guys do a great job keeping it today. Yeah. Um, great. So maybe we can try to move through these a little quicker. I know we're running short on time. Um, uh, 
So yeah, in terms of what the data can provide, so we say a lot of this um, information is usually handled off, you know, between consultants, you know, analyzing the data, it gets boiled down um, and then included in reports. Uh, but just thinking about visualizations, other things that, you know, might be accessible to planners as well has often come up when we think about, you know, are there other ways to visualize this data? Um, uh, one of the things that came to mind are just different online tools that are available to look at kind of movement between zones. I know we used one example from Healdsburg as we're looking between two different um, station lines, you know, how's the travel affected between these two areas. So um, just wondering if there are other tools or anything along those lines that people are using outside of the Sonoma <laughs> County travel model to kind of do that travel behavior, travel movement analysis, or is it mostly kind of relying on? I would say I, I think it's, it's like completely rely on consultants to engage with the model. I, I've never even tried to engage with your model. As a, yeah. as a <laughs> yeah. That's Stay not friend. something I do, but uh, your, your mentioning of other visual visualization tools, I think is, that's really interesting. And I think that can go a long way towards kind of educating, not just planners, but also decision makers and the average public as to how, you know, these improvements are anticipated to make change. Uh, and again, as we get into this new housing world where there's going to be such significant increased densities allowed almost by right in many instances, um, being able to, to talk about how certain improvements are going to be implemented and the anticipated changes and, and to present that information, that'll be more and more critical. So as you guys come up with ideas, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, I think I'll tag on to what Noah was saying. It's sort of 3M4. I think there's, um, just in reading through your memo, the scope of the program um, was kind of, or has been focused on Highway 101. Uh, I think just certainly with, you know, most of the counties, 5,000 units, how many units do you guys have in your arena outside of that? I'm a little concerned that there'd be, you know, that, like I attended the Fulton Road uh, improvement uh, meeting the other day, and I was like, oh, they're basically making it a no stoplight east-west. What the hell is that going to do on the east side of Spastopol? We got to get that into the model because, that, I mean, just you know, and I know our main street, our sustainable transportation grant is going to be trying to coordinate with hopefully tying into the general plan update um, for the county, because I know there's like Occidental Road and others that are already having uh, where they get 116 issues, but they're going to become more and more critical as that 5,000 units gets built out in the county uh, off of the 101 corridor. Really the same issue with East Katati and all the development going on in Southeast Run of Perk. Everybody, yeah, needs, to, yeah, everybody yeah. needs to get to 101 and they come through Katati. And so understanding yeah. those regional connections and then leveraging the regional traffic impact fee yeah. and making sure that that money is being spent to mitigate these projects that aren't in the areas where the development occurs, that's critical for us. Yeah. And if it makes you feel better, it's only 3824. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe we'll move on to uh, next few questions, kind of from the technical operational standpoint. Um, you know, the first question would be Matt, how the travel model is being used um, and I think this is, you know, maybe just self-reflecting, like we were saying, we're in this process of going from a more traditional trip-based model to an activity-based model. So I think that's kind of where we're really focusing on <clears throat> updating this existing structure and functionality um, to be able to better um, address kind of the, the actual travel patterns um, and do maybe more advanced analysis as well. Um, so unless there's any thoughts, I can maybe just answer that first one. The second one, I, I think, might be a little bit more relevant. Um, you know, just thinking about what we've gone through in terms of the development review process, what's coming up as well. 
um, in terms of tracking development projects. The county, I know, is has so many projects, you know, as we're going through and saying, you know, are these the most up to date? How does this reflect with your current databases? Um, and then the housing element information as well, too, you know, we'll be happy to share that as well. So, you know, just thinking about the procedures, policies we have, you know, from a, the data analyst perspective, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to make those efficiencies in our review process. So just wondering if there's any reflections, thoughts on kind of the process we've gone through in asking for de development data or other travel model related data, if there's some ways that um, you know, we can improve upon that process. I'm definitely open to to ideas. Um, and Adam, you had yeah. used our APRs from last year, mm -hmm. and I just want to say thank you. Yeah. We have to fill out so many forms already, so just having you use that, which is already has that whole pipeline, and you can mm -hmm. see exactly what's there, is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. That makes I think it easier. And that's a great example of, yeah, just making sure those efficiencies are in place for that. Um, and just so you know, the Economic Development Board does do certain surveys as well in terms of hotel development and some of the other stuff. Um, I don't, you know, yeah. so I don't know if you're tying into that or not, but you might want to contact Lauren Cartwright at PDB about that. Okay, that's a great suggestion. We haven't quite tied into that too much, but yeah. Yeah, I feel like once a quarter, they reach out and ask for the updates on any uh, things like hotels and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do TOT, like a TOT survey or something too, don't they? Just to get an, a read on how many rooms there are, stuff like that. Is that? Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, okay. that's the hotel. Yeah, that's the, that that's the quarterly update they yeah. ask for, yeah. So is that total or what's being planned? Both. They ask for both. Oh, okay. So it's a similar to the uh, the uh, housing report, but for hotels. So it's another option. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and then I guess the other thing that I'm, you know, working on that makes sense in some respects of what data we can update in the travel model and maybe less so with others, but is trying to uh, use Power BI to create dashboards. We're doing that for our greenhouse gas inventory. And it's a lot of sense to be able to do that with our development data as well, um, as that goes into the model. Um, you know, the roads and bike paths, I'm not as sure about, but in terms of figuring out how can we do a better job of just having that data publicly available, but then also making sure that it stays up to date within the travel model, seems like a potential, you know, new tool to be able to use. I don't want to overburden with people with tools that they're not going to want to say, but um, thinking about how that would work and operate is, yeah, you know, a priority to make sure that it's not added for. Um, but yeah, any other thoughts just around this and the procedures, protocols for the travel model? The one thing just, you know, just make sure your engagement consultant as much as us, because you know, from my standpoint, you guys are doing great, but they're the ones who actually utilize it, I would say, more. Yeah. So they may have more like nuanced or specific feedback. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. They generally have fewer filters, so we definitely hear about issues. Yeah. Well, there you yeah. Go. <laughs> that's, 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 that's right. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good point. Just to, on when consultants do use the data or the model, we have, you know, disclaimers that ask them to identify any potential issues as well. But yeah, doing that verbally is important as well. But yeah. Yeah. And then I guess maybe just the last question, just around outputs. I know we've talked about DMT is kind of the main one that we're really trying to analyze just because that feeds into so much of our work. Um, but yeah, any other, I'm sorry, I don't have a list in front of me of what the outputs are that was in the previous yeah. report, but anything else that feels compelling to be able to, when you're analyzing a development project, an area plan, what are, what's the kind of data information that you want to get out of when you say here's a new development or here's how the transportation network will change? Yeah. Any any thoughts? Was that just into maintaining a level of service is still important. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I will say that even though CEQA is VMT, I mean, what our communities see and what we hear about, <laughs> and I'm already hearing about it from our draft EIR is traffic. 
and dysfunction of intersections and making sure, and you know, that's that question about the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, okay, it may have no impact on DMT, but it's going to have a huge impact potentially on delays and backing things up. And, you know, that is, we still analyze for projects of 10 units or more for level of service and that particular, you know, site safety egress kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, maintaining that level of service and understanding that in the regional plan stuff, it's still really important. That's very good. Thank you. Um, I had a question that goes back to one of the data update. Um, I'm not sure exactly which question it fits in, but yeah, that's fine. In terms of the data that you were looking at to keep your model up to date and accurate, um, I'm not sure if you look, um, like if you're using parcel specifically versus just a geolocation of something and kind of how that fits in with keeping you updated when we also have land that's being subdivided at different times and in little bits, because that will continue to happen. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. So we are, we have transitioned to try to look at that parcel level mm -hmm. um, and look at the, what's being added as well too, because there's a lot of rural parcels that might just have an ADD. Um, so looking both at kind of the size, but then yeah, the parcel level. Uh, and that, you know, brings up a great point. I think just something to think about for the APR data and how to make sure that that's tracked as efficiently is that oftentimes when there is a large subdivision, it might have a name of that subdivision, but then when it goes into the APR, the name are just the individual addresses. Yeah. And so figuring out, oh, how do we make sure that those stay associated with each other is something that um, I would encourage all of you to maybe think about when you're filling out your APR. Um, I don't have a great solution right now, but you know we went through and figured it all out. Um, but just to think about how that is consistent then um, when you're reporting helps us a great deal. So then we can just say, here was this large, you know, subdivision or large parcel. Now that's these individual ones, we can look at the county um, parcel data and make sense of what's there. Um, but being able to do that joint efficiently is really helpful. Um, I know the one other issue with the APR data is very minor. But just if there's an existing residence, you know, on one of those subdivisions that is going to be kept, you know, making sure we know what's existing is going to be staying and then what's going to be added. I mean, that was not a very minor thing sometimes in the APR data. But um, yeah, so I think, yeah, just making sure that we're using the same. And then obviously, I'd love to get this information online and available so we can kind of cross reference that. So that makes sense rather than just a spreadsheet. So I know that you work with each of the jurisdictions, but one thing that I think would give me and maybe future you value is, you know, if you just kind of made a list of like your ideal, like this is the information that you would have delivered to you every single time, because I'd really like to get to a point where we can just like run a report in our system to get you what you want. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is a huge lift but the sooner we kind of know exactly maybe not necessarily what you ask for right now but what you would ask for in the <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that is yeah i was just thinking the same thing we just transitioned to e-permitting and last january and we're actually kind of going through because we were finding there's some reports that i need to be able to run or want to be able to run that we, they're actually you know like literally in the next month going to be doing that kind of a thing mm -hmm. so that we can run the reports just directly from our permitting system mm -hmm. yeah um and i just sent an email off to this point so there's a great idea that came out of the director of planning for petaluma who's saying if there's some type because if there's a single person receiving all different types of project applications it's you know in addition you know, to a, to a roof, to a house or something like that. Maybe it's just adding a room. That doesn't quite meet our standard where we're looking at like, what's going to increase DMT essentially? Um, so a new, a new unit or, you know, some significant new commercial space. And so what he suggested was that there be some little, you know, filter or something. As a project comes in, 
it could be like the SCTA, you know, tag or something that says, is this going to be a project that's going to add significant or notable DMT? And so it's just making that little notation. And then when you, when we come around knocking, you know, you can say, okay, filter out by FCTA. Mm -hmm. This should then be all of the projects that, uh, that kind of meet this criteria that aren't just minor uh, non DMT um, generating projects, but actually have something significant. Um, so yeah, that would be, and each, I know jurisdiction has its own system, so um, I know that's easier said than done to say, just make a little tag, and <laughs> a little filter on your yeah, the search button, but that's the basic concept, and so then you can make, maybe go back and then, um, just be able to export that. How does that kind of resonate with folks? I know this is kind of an awkward. So a tag probably isn't a yeah, whatever the with our system, terms, you yeah. know, we can query by any number of factors. So, you know, what I'm looking for is new dwelling units, new additions to commercial space, because that does, or change of use, those kinds of things that would be change traffic patterns. Mm -hmm. And it might even just be, yeah. But if we know what those are, then, then yeah, we can probably <clears throat> run a report that filters, uh, just make our own query. Yeah, one thing we could think about is that we have the different land use types, and we can say, you know, from these different land use types, what would generate some significant DMT and what wouldn't? And I think residential seems like the most obvious, but we can think through some of the other land use categories if there's something. Yeah, additional square feet, footages, things like that. Typically works for yeah. me. Additional right. square feet or change of views. Like yeah. we had a retail go to self storage. So that's actually right. probably a yeah. reduction yeah. or a commercial go to a residential uh, unit. Yeah. So those change of use is not necessarily a change of square foot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But Scott, I think we could work on just like, you know, here's the list of perfect things, right? Or like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just like it's to be moving towards and, and have a good sense of you know what you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I, we have a good sense of what you're looking for, but what you want to be getting to yeah. is as yeah, we could make like a spreadsheet template or something like that. Mm -hmm. The empty wish list. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I think it, <laughs> the ideal perfect world, like. You know, if you're using Power BI, it's you know kind of feeding into like the APIs of different systems and just directly pulling in. I mean, well, that's that's the total perfect. Yeah. Yes. I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon, <laughs> but uh, at least taking out the the kind of manual um, need for you to sit down with each jurisdiction mm -hmm. every year and pull our teeth. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly my wish list. You guys maintain the list. We just can import it and then well not but figuring out yeah what's up on that list that we require yes part of the trip too. So thank you very much. Great. Any other questions, thoughts? I have one oh, last yeah. question kind of jumping off that. If we are moving to that direction where at the jurisdiction level we're able to set up reports and just kind of here you go, here's your information based on the report. It seems useful to see who where the commonalities are between who's using which software um yeah whether you're excel or e or track it or whatever yeah so else. the people using the same ones can work together to create their little query um and not have to do it for each one yeah so. yeah we just as an example one of the things that <clears throat> we were just asked to start tracking from the board was that we had we noted if it was affordable or not but the board really wants to be able to know what level of affordability and how many. I know that's in the APR data, and I kind of said, okay, yes, it's this many and glossed over the distinctions, but that'll be something we'll be including in updating um, future analyses. So, yeah, great to have an understanding of yeah what fields we want and, and all that. So, great. And I actually think that'll help you with uh, there's different parking requirements based on affordable housing versus not affordable housing, and so that could help. With the data, another data point of the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. All right. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you all. Great update. Uh, so now we're this is uh, item nine on the agenda: standing updates, member discussion.
And I'm going to pick on Carrie because she's on my left. <laughs> I'll just go right to her. All right. Um, a few things. One, our city council has adopted our objective design standards. That was a big uh, year and a half long process. Um, for VMT, we've been working with Fair and Peers and um, looking to bring that uh, thresholds to our planning commission in mid-February and then the council. We are looking at the city level uh, VMT for our, well, A, the SETA model, which is far superior to the, the A bag uh, in terms of specificity, especially since they keep cutting off the half of Sonoma County and all their maps. Uh, but uh, no, just specificity you guys have in the model is far superior, as well as the runtime, seeing those statistics. I, I also defer to consultants, so I had no idea. It was like two days to run the MTC model versus a couple hours for you guys. So, um, but yeah, city specific for residential, uh, there's a desire to want to track uh, our, you know, residential VMT progress over time. And then the uh, regional or the um, office side of things, we are looking at um, what the threshold for retail to screen out should be. Fifty thousand from OPR is way huge, and I'd love to get Healdsburg perspective because I know you guys have like ten thousand um, or others. Um, you know why why you picked what you picked because that's a discussion we'll be having in February as well as potential starting to discuss mitigations, thinking about mitigation bank stuff in the future or offsite improvements within the city. Um, we have our RFP out for our sustainable transportation grant, which is looking at um, Main Street uh, streets redesign, the Highway 12, Highway 116, uh, Caltrans intersections and all the congestion. Um, so yeah, Barn, uh, Chris, I had actually talked to you a little bit about trying to set up a meeting with you, the county and Santa Rosa, um, as our stakeholders in that. Um, and so, yeah, that's obviously in the new year, but um, the RFP is due in January and we're looking to have a consultant on board probably sometime in February, start in March ish. Um, we just released our draft EIR for City Ventures 80 unit um, plus potential 16 ADUs on the north side of town. Um, and Scott, I'd love to uh, chat with you a little bit about that because there's impacts on the Occidental Road intersection below thresholds, but still can, that's a bigger, you know, concern. Uh, we have a hearing on that January 9th for the draft of that. And of course, we're getting a new city manager, uh, Don Schwartz, is coming from Burnley Park. He starts in January, so I've knocked him a couple times already, excited about that. Our project home key grant is still in, been having, that's for the uh, St. Vincent de Paul, which owns the uh, site, site on the north side of town, which is um, right now the RV uh, safe parking site, but uh, the county is hoping to start to transition uh, in preparation for hopefully getting that grant and moving forward with, that would be 22 units of permanent, extremely low housing and what they're looking to do with permanent supportive housing. And then the Elderberry Commons, which is also Project Home Key, has submitted their building permits and hopefully going to get started on that. The Woodmark Project 48 units is about to start vertical construction on their phase one uh, 48 units. Uh, I think it's about it. Right. <laughs> a, lot, a lot going on. <laughs> a lot going on. Uh, Let's we'll keep going around the table, Scott. Uh, I'd say the biggest thing for the county is in, uh, so on the, the 12th, we kicked off our general plan, comprehensive general plan update. Um, so that'll be uh, hopefully a five-year process, potentially a six-year process. Uh, but it, it, we are planning for it to be a comprehensive update, you know, reassessing the elements that we have, adding new ones. Um, uh, on the, the arena topic, so while arena is 3824, we've got about 3,000 units in our builder's remedy pipeline. So uh, we're well on our way. <laughs> uh, but uh, and I believe 
Sonoma County is the first jurisdiction where every single jurisdiction has a certified housing model. So yes, yeah, uh, yes, that is good job, everybody. Yeah, everybody. Uh, so I think that's really the the biggest step from us from a, a project standpoint. From a personnel standpoint, in January we'll be having a new deputy director of planning, deputy director of administration, and outreach program manager starting. So it's basically half of our senior leadership team. Uh, will be fresh people. So I'm very excited about that and looking forward to all of you meeting them. And Will, I don't know if you have any other yeah, updates. You covered it. Okay. All right, great. Thank, Thank you guys. Uh, we'll go to Zoom. Have anybody on our Zoom participants uh, actively and eagerly waiting to provide an update? I'll give them a moment to wake up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Ada, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, uh, you're muted. <clears throat> Just want to make two quick announcements. Um, one APR workshop, kind of new legislation, um, only a half hour uh, with HCD on, on the 8th. So I think most of you are given outreach. If not, um, I'll, it'll be in the bulletin update I send you. And then the other thing is priority sites deadline for applying for funding is the 15th. So just a reminder, I, I think a lot of the outreach probably went to housing departments, but just in case you identified some priority sites, nominated priority sites, and there might be infrastructure or other kinds of things, you might wanna to talk to either your economic development and housing teams to consider applying for the funding. And Ada, that's not for new priority sites, that's for funding for ones that were, or is this for new priority sites? The round that was nominated but in this fall? Yeah, so, like a September deadline, I think. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. Uh, Ada, anybody at DC? Uh, we'll swing around to Santa Rosa. Um, I'm sure Jessica Jones has something to provide you with, but I do not. Skip us for now. Ellen from Healdsburg? Sure. <clears throat> um, so Healdsburg, we're still pretty busy. We have a lot going on. Um, with our three larger development projects on the north end of town, we have um, Saggio Hills, which is the montage development, and all the estate homes and uh, harvest homes, as they call them, their villas, are going in. <clears throat> so we're busy finalizing all of those. Um, and then North Village is well underway, and we're getting a new hotel there that went vertical maybe a month or so ago. Um, and then the Mill District, which is down on the south end of town. Um, we are currently working on a downtown uh, density study with Opticos, so we're studying the underutilized sites around town, um, trying to show potential of what housing could be built on those underutilized sites and kind of what the density could be. Um, so we'll see where, where that goes, but that's slated to be completed in maybe April. <clears throat> um, we, I don't think we did updates last time, so we did uh, work with Fair and Fears and we adopted the VMT thresholds with the help of Chris, which was great. Um, our housing element was certified a couple months back, and let's see, we're working on taking action uh, with our climate mobilization strategy that was recently adopted, um, so we've taken all those measures and are going through and assigning them to different departments and working on those. Um, and then we'll be looking to kick off a South Entry Area Plan, uh, which is everything kind of Southeast-ish across Memorial Bridge. Um, so we'll be doing that hopefully within the next year. We'd like to kick that off. I think that's it for me. Great, thank you. Yeah. And the Oakville Grocery is no more. That's Oakville so Grocery is no more. more. <laughs> it is no longer. It'll be Acorn Cafe. Elliot, do you have anything for a refer? Uh, a couple little things. We did have our new director start last week, um, Ali Gutiche. Uh, no relation to the, he's the vice mayor? The vice mayor. <laughs> our RFQ for the downtown development closes on the 22nd of January, so just about a month out. We're looking at a May or June selection of a developer for the downtown site, so that is moving forward. Um. General plan still slated for summer adoption. Um, movement in kind of all the big subdivision areas. I think SOMO is kind of the most exciting right there, nearing getting their first building permit. So 
after the rain stop, they should be going forward there. And the last update I have is that we are taking first set of some zoning code updates for housing element implementation uh, in a couple months. All right, thank you. Uh, for Patati, uh, we adopted a mobile home park senior overlay ordinance um, in response to some of the shenanigans that have been going on with our mobile home park ownership. Uh, so that's in place, or the last second reading occurred uh, this month and it'll go into place in, in January. Uh, working on our active transportation plan, thank you, Dana and SCT and staff for your help with that. It's going really well. Excited to see it as a draft uh, in the new year. Uh, Centauro Way specific plan update is underway, and we're doing a lot of engagement work, and uh, our partners poorly for doing that for us, uh, primarily, and we have uh, actively, um, basically we put an office within the plan area, so it's a really uh, awesome engagement tool, so Four Leaf staff opened up their office in the depot building uh, at the plan, so people can just come in and stop by and provide input, so uh, it's a really innovative uh, embedded planning um, kind of approach. Uh, and then the city just completed purchase on 120 East Katati Avenue. So that was the site of our uh, SB35 five-story tower. Mm -hmm. uh, the developer had kind of found some alternative locations and the city's council uh, gave some funding funds to buy that site. So we will be moving forward with a uh, project to develop it, uh, looking for some sponsors uh, and, and uh, partners. Uh, also in the new year, we'll have an RFQ going out. Um, and we, the Planning Commission just acted on a 35 unit single family subdivision at the south end of town. Uh, the last parcel on Old Redwood Highway as you head out of town, uh, single family kind of standard subdivision. But it's nice to get some, some housing projects approved and we have a few more teed up for action on 116 uh, in the early part of 2024. So that, thank you for everybody for being on Solstice, the shortest day of the year. <laughs> uh, uh, from here on out, the days will be getting longer. That's exactly right. And so I hope everybody has a great Christmas and New Year's story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That was going to be my first year. My first year. I hope to never use that, but.